We're just waiting a bit to get everybody um, in the meeting room. more waiting. Don't worry, we'll get everybody in. Thank you, Michelle. I think we are going to have to meet everybody, including me. It could be me. Has, every, has the noise stopped for everyone? Yes. Yes, that's better. Brilliant. Oh, see, that's popularity. David, is everybody, is anybody waiting to join the meeting? Or do you think everybody's joined? Oh, I think there are a few waiting. We'll just I'll let people in as they come in. And uh, maybe a few, a few stragglers and whatnot. Uh, so I just left for Ken as they come in. Okay. There's 73 in at the moment so far. Fantastic. Um, well, first of all, a huge thank you to David, who's still on holiday and doing this. Bit of a suntan there, David. Where have you been? But thank you ever so much for coming so back. And, and Nicola for, uh, I think you've just come back off holiday. So what was going to be a little... Um, Bijou meeting, the word has spread and uh, now we have 74, 75 people in um, to come and listen to Nicola Innes, who I'd like to say thank you so much. Like I say, it was going to be a little, um, a little meeting for specialists, but uh, welcome consultants as well. Um, so I first met Nicola, gosh, nearly 20 years ago when she kindly agreed to come down to Stoke Mandeville to talk on something called the Hall Technique. Um, and wow, did that change paediatric dentistry, uh, patients' lives and paediatric dentists' lives. Um, 150 publications la later, over 150 publications later, Nicola has once again very kindly agreed tonight with a team to introduce us to the evidence and the technique of using silver diamine fluoride. Perhaps the next biggest change for paediatric dentistry, especially in these non-AGP times. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, Nicola, thank you so much for doing this. And I will close my mic. Um, so if, if we can use the chat function, please, to um, ask questions. Um, David is going to collate those, hopefully, and perhaps be the spokesperson at the end to ask Nicola, um, be your voice. Um, if that's OK with you, Nicola, um, I will switch off my mic and pass over to you. Good luck and thank you. Well, thank you very much. I don't know how Jane, anybody could ever deny Jane anything that they, she asks them to do. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here tonight, and I'm really uh, very honoured to be asked to talk to you about SDF and really pleased that there's so much interest in it because we've been using it for a little while um, and more so sometimes. So I'll get on so we don't spoil the too long. I'm just going to try and share my screen, which might take me a moment or two. Um, I think we're 
almost there. So this should come up now, hopefully. And just, you know, it doesn't work that way. You're nearly there. You've got to do things in a certain order on Teams to get it to work. And that wasn't the right order. Um, no. Let's try again. No, for the th I'm going to try it again. Sorry, I think it was because I was using two screens. So, apologies. I'm going to try once more. And I think, can you see my screen at the moment? Somebody will have to show it because I can't see anybody. Yes, you got it. Thanks. Is that? Thank you. Uh, right, so thank you. And I'm assuming that's the, the screen about silver diamond fluoride and not whatever I happen to be watching on Netflix a little while ago. OK, so we're going to talk about the role in the use of silver diamond fluoride for the management of caries lesions in children. I'm going to take you through um, a little bit of a brief background to it and a little bit of the evidence and talk about clinically how it's used. And I thought we'd talk about one or two of the controversial areas and see if we can um, just bat through some of the barriers to its use. And I'll talk about my, one of my PhD students' work because that's exactly what he's been looking at, barriers and facilitators to the use of, of um, SDA. So before I start, I've got a statement up about the conflict of interest. And I want to thank the Specialist Society very much, not just for asking me to talk, but they offered me a fee to talk. Um, and of course, I'm actually a member of the society, so I felt I couldn't take the fee. But when I said that to my children and they realised they were getting kicked out of the living room again for the evening, they asked that I donate the fee to a charity. So I let them choose it and they've chosen Vasculitis Scotland. So thank you very much to the Specialist Society for donating my fee to there. And if anybody else um, would like to donate from the consultants group who's here, that would be wonderful. Thank you. So uh, I've written the aims and objectives so that you can have CPD. And the aim is just to have an overview of the evidence for and the use of silver diamond fluoride in the management of carious lesions in children specifically, although we know it's used in other lesions too, but that's obviously what we're going to focus on. The objectives are to understand the evidence, list the indications, contraindications, and to be able to describe the steps for use of SDF with children. The other objectives really are around trying to understand those nuances um, behind using something that has some disadvantages, obviously the discoloration not least, and using it off-label uh, within dentistry and what that means for us. So I'll take you through this little roadmap. We'll look at the microbiome, what silver fluoride is, uh, what the evidence for it is, how to use it, advantages and disadvantages, indications and contraindications. Now, before I start, I'm going to talk a little bit about the microbiome. I'm sorry, I know it's, a, I, I don't even know what day it is because it's COVID time, but I think it's Tuesday and it's an evening and the last thing you want to do after a busy day at work is listen to some dreary academic droning on about the microbiome and caries lesions. But it honestly will make your diagnosis and your use of SDF a little bit easier if you can understand why it works and you'll begin to appreciate the situations that it's more likely and least likely to work in then. So I'm not going to read you, <laughs> this paper to you, I've just put it up um, as a recommendation of a very nice paper to read that gives a modern take on the oral microbiome and what um, is actually going on in there. And what is going on in there? Well, we know now that the oral microbiome is an incredibly complex uh, group of organisms that almost function together. All the little bacteria and uh, some of the other bits and pieces, fungi and things that are in there, function together to make what almost behaves like a, an organism in its own right. So it's got different bits that produce different things and it's well laid out. It's very, very highly structured. 
and it's got pores and channels in it that create an environment that allows it to thrive. So this, these pictures just show um, a kind of 3D spatial organisation of the plaque microbiome. It's from a few, a couple of years ago, about four years ago now. But when it came out, people were surprised at just the massively organised nature of dental plaque. So when you stain up different microorganisms in different colours, you can see that they find their own strata, they find their own niche, and they live where they're happiest. A bit like us, which is why we also often liken the microbiome to a city. But we've known a lot about the microbiome for many, many years, over 120 years of research, in fact. And uh, this is Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek, a bit of history thrown in there for a Tuesday evening as well, just to keep it light and fun. And back in 1680, he pointed out these little animalcules uh, and the presence of them and the abundance of them. But he was actually quite an amazing guy beyond even his work on microscopy and discovering uh, the bacteria and plaque. He noted that there were different groups or different behaviours, different amounts in different people's mouth, depending on the state of the mouth. And of course, we know that that is one of the fundamental things about dental caries, that if you've got a high caries rate and lots of plaque and things, it behaves differently to someone who's brushing regularly and has less plaque in the mouth. That becomes of relevance to us when we begin to think about what's going on actually at the much finer level of the, the lesion and not just the patient's mouth. So, um, oh yes, there he is. He said, the number of these animalcules in the scurf on a man's teeth are so many that I believe they exceed the number of men in a kingdom. And this again is just to finally emphasise um, a paper by Parishar et al emphasise that within this mass of plaque that we see in our patient's mouth, there's actually a very delicately balanced ecostructure and communication system. This is why the whole technique works, and it's why SDF works. We disrupt that biofilm. We disrupt that society, that organised, um, cooperative, cooperative communicating society of bacteria. And when we disrupt them, when we cause them to get um, unhappy with their environment, they either stop thriving or they die off altogether. So it behaves a bit like a city. And that's how we make use of the information. So with the whole technique, what we essentially do is we take the city and we seal it under a big dome and we stop nutrients getting in or we stop lorries getting into the city. We stop the waste products of the biofilm getting out to make them keep the environment favourable. And just like in the city, we stop the waste products getting out or the rubbish bins or the lorries, the whole thing begins to fall apart. So, disrupting the city. We're going to do it with SDF, or we're going to talk about how we do it with SDF in, in this talk. What is SDF? Well, basically, silver dining fluoride is a clear, odourless, metallic tasting liquid. It stains most oxidisable surfaces black, which is why we get the discoloration. Um, but it doesn't just stain teeth, it doesn't just stain caries lesions, it will stain your skin, it will stain your dental work surface, it will even stain your metallic uh, tray that you've got, so you have to be careful with it. It's first used in Japan in 1969, uh, somebody did their PhD looking at it and from there Saffiride came out in Japan and they used that and have used it um, ever since. So a lot of the research has come from round about Japan and that part of the world. Silver nitrate was also being used in America and Australia and some other parts of the world, and they've been investigating that. But it seems to be SDF that the woman has taken off in terms of popularity with uh, silver products. It was cleared for use by the FDA in the US in 2014 and licensed for desensitisation in many countries uh, and for actually arresting caries in Canada and Brazil. So there is a precedent for it being licensed for arresting caries and for it being used specifically for that purpose, that licensed purpose. Okay, so what is the evidence for SDA? Well, there are lots of clinical trials. I'm not going to go through them all, but there are also lots of systematic reviews and I'm also not going to go through all of them. I've tried to pull out some of the salient points for you. Um, you can find the evidence 
in the EDU website and under the BSPD website, it's got some information as well. The ADA, I thought I'd bring up just now, have interestingly made SDF part of their clinical practice guidelines, and that was two years ago. It was subject to um, a lot of discussion and it took an awful lot of pushing from certain quarters to get it accepted uh, as a solution because of the issue with it being um, initially only uh, registered for use as a desensitising agent. However, it seems to be uh, grown and it seems to have grown in popularity ever since they managed to get it licensed and it's used widely across the US. They recommend the biannual application for advanced cavitated lesions and they, they put a corollary onto that though. They say it's if access to care is limited uh, for uncooperative patients or for patients when a general anaesthetic is not considered safe. I think if we're advocating something for certain groups of patients, we've got to look at why those patients deserve it and why it might be appropriate for other patients as well. Um, you can read that report, it's actually available on the ADU website. So it's called Evidence-Based Clinical Practice Guidelines on what they term non-restorative treatments for KU solutions. The other, I think, uh, main information or evidence that's come around recently is an umbrella review that my PhD student Nassar Sifo carried out. Uh, and an umbrella review is a review of the evidence that takes all of the systematic reviews that are around into consideration and puts them all together. And um, we found in that review that there were lots of systematic reviews. In fact, the systematic reviews outnumbered the primary trials that had actually been done on, on SDF, uh, which seemed a bit ridiculous. And we drilled down into those reviews to try and look at what they were telling us. They were all a bit different. Some of them looked at root caries, some of them looked at coronal caries, some of them looked at different ways of using SDF. Um, but when we put them all together, we found that basically they all said, each review said the same thing, no matter what methodology they used and no matter which trials they included. They consistently supported the effectiveness of SDF for arresting coronal caries in the primary dentition. That was the strongest evidence that was there. They also supported it for arresting and preventing root caries in older adults, but there wasn't enough evidence to make a conclusion on whether SDF could be used to prevent carious lesions in children. And I, I honestly think that we don't need to worry about that at the moment. We've got enough other preventive measures that if we could get them used, um, we'd be successful. So when is it successful to use SDF? Well, it's more successful when it's used in cleansable lesions and in accessible areas of the mouth. So when caries is more severe, severe or affects multiple teeth, then it's got repeated applications. Um, and usually uh, there are different papers will say different amounts of applications, but the ADA and most other places kind of agree that two weeks and then six weeks is a good repeat if you need it. And then six months and twice yearly if you've got an open lesion to keep using it. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on and the alternatives. So what do people think of SDF? Well, Yasmin Crystal, Yasmini Crystal in New York did a nice study looking at parental acceptability of um, darkened lesions in the mouth. And she did a nice study that looked at a balance between what did parents find acceptable in one situation and what did they find acceptable in another situation? And Nassar Sifo, my PhD student, is just about to publish his work, which has taken a similar perspective, although we've gone on and done some other things as well. So what did Yasmi find? Well, she found that parents didn't really find the discoloration acceptable when the, the staining was there on its own and there was nothing to balance against it. So it was unacceptable in 73% of the cases. But if you balance that against saying, well, the alternative rather than nothing is a general anaesthetic to fix these teeth, then suddenly that balance changed and 69% of the parents felt it was more acceptable. So this comes down again to how we talk to parents, how we explain things, 
and also the options that are available for children. And at the moment, of course, our options are so incredibly limited that perhaps it's a conversation that we find a bit easier to have. So I think um, we're very good at selling what we do to parents. We're very good at explaining to people what we do. I think if we just have a script that we can run through that explains some of the options and the downsides as well as the advantages, that gives people a fair chance to make an assessment on what they would wish, then um, perhaps the acceptability factor, certainly at the moment, won't be such a big problem as we perceive it. So what about clinicians' acceptability, our acceptability, and when we're trying to get our students or staff to use it or we're, we're trying to think about introducing it into our organisation? Well, uh, Nassar did a very nice qualitative study with parents, uh, with clinicians round about Scotland, and he's just got that paper submitted to BNC Oral Health. We're just responding to the reviewers' comments at the moment. But it's pre-published, so it's available on BNC Oral Health. And he was very happy for me to share with you the findings. So he undertook semi-structured interviews with a whole bunch of different dental professionals, some in NHS Tayside, Grampian, some in practice, some in secondary care, some in the hospital, some in community settings. And overall, he found that people generally thought the advantages were much as you and I would think anyway, and for those of us that have used it, see that you require minimum cooperation. You still do require some, of course. You reduce referral to secondary care, likely. It's simple, easy, non-invasive, and it helps acclimatise children. But of course, the disadvantages are the staining. Some people felt it's a disadvantage that it comes in a clear solution because it's actually quite difficult to see. But it's worth saying that there are some products not available in the UK at the moment, but there are some around that have a blue tint in them that make them easier to see. It's got an unpleasant taste, which people felt put the children off, and we've come up with a bit of a solution to that and difficulties accessing some areas. So the barriers really were related to those disadvantages, but people also said that they felt that using it off-label was a big barrier for them. They didn't feel confident. For general practitioners, the fact that it wasn't listed in Scotland in our statement of dental remuneration was a barrier. Um, they also felt that getting practitioners to use a different fluoride varnish or fluoride agent other than fluoride varnish might be a bit tricky. And of course, some of us have got patients who are very against any fluoride, so that was a barrier anyway. But they also pointed out some enablers to us that we were trying to put into place. So an information leaflet in our practice, and we've got one for our patients that I'm going to show you, which is available through the British Dental Journal and on the BSPD website, I think. Training, listing it in the SDR, the Statement of Dental Remuneration in Scotland, or having it accepted, I guess, wherever it is you're working. Improving the evidence and guidelines and developing ways to minimise the staining were all seen as enablers. So just to um, run through another controversy, or a controversy that we have, with SDF. It's called silver diamine fluoride, but it should really have two M's in it. Everybody says it well, writes it with one M, and all the research that you see, virtually all of it, is published with one M, but it's actually incorrect. So if somebody challenges you on it ever, as uh, we recently were in, a BD, in the BDG paper that we wrote, it should, strictly speaking, have the two M's. It's not really important to us as clinicians, but um, it's something people get hung up about because they wonder, is it a different compound? Is it a different thing that's in their particular brand of SDF they're using if it's a different one? But it isn't, it's just a naming thing. Uh, so it's, it should have two M's, it's an NH3, and we don't know why, but somehow dentistry's got it wrong and gives it the wrong name. What does it look like? Well. In the UK, we have Riva Star available to us, which is made by SDI, an Australian company, and they've licensed it. They've gone through the process of getting it licensed in the UK as a desensitising agent. We also have um, a couple of other, a picture of a couple of other kinds of SDF that are available here. Advantage Arrest is available in the US, and Safari, the one at the bottom, is the uh, Jap Japanese one. Advantage Arrest now looks different to that. It's been marketed now with a blue tint, which makes it a little bit easier to see. It's one of the ones. 
and Riva Star are also changing their product development at the moment. So what do we see in that product there? Uh, those of you that have used it will know and recognise it, obviously, and you'll be aware that there are two sets of capsules, the silver ones and the green ones. The silver ones are actually the silver diamine fluoride, and the green ones are potassium iodide. Now, initially, these were developed um, in parallel by the Australian groups. And I have to say, up until today, I had been labouring under the uh, wrong impression that the potassium iodide was there simply to remove the discoloration or reduce the discoloration. Uh, in fact, a little bit of digging today by uh, another one of my colleagues, Waraf Al Yassin, on my behalf, very kindly, she looked into potassium iodide and it seems that actually it's there to potentiate the action of SDF. And I don't think this is very well known. But when we looked at the papers, it does indeed seem to do that. And there was a recent big study from Cambodia, which has just been published by Bethy Turton, um, that has got quite a lot of information on different groups. And when they used potassium iodide straight after the SDF, it actually did reduce the cane rate in their cohorts a little bit more. So that's worth bearing in mind. I have to say to date, I haven't used the, the potassium iodide apart from once just to try it out because it, it doesn't seem to work for discoloration and the evidence shows that it's pretty contentious, but on the whole, it doesn't seem to reduce it by very much. You still get the black stain or you get a dark brown stain, but it certainly doesn't make it disappear. So I hadn't really bothered about it. And also, I feel that the darkness is quite an advantage to me when I'm looking at these lesions because it makes it easier when you re-photograph them, uh, as I'm able to do in, in the hospital, to see when they've actually progressed or got bigger or bits have broken off or whatever. So I prefer to be able to see the dark stain, certainly in, in posterior teeth. So I never really bothered with it, but I commend it to you to maybe try and in future, having read the papers I've read today, I will add um, potassium iodide into the steps that I use. So, mechanism of action. Right, briefly, it works in two different ways, one on the bacterial wall and one on the tooth enamel. It's not quite so simple that silver works on the bacterial wall uh, the bacteria and the fluoride works on the cell wall. It's slightly more complicated than that. But effectively, you can think of it as having four different mechanisms of action. The first on the cariogenic bacteria, it can either break through the cell wall, disrupt the cellular respiration or attack the DNA, or it can actually work on the biofilm. Now we know that both the silver and the fluoride can um, also inhibit the formation or the breakdown of collagen by inhibiting the enzymes that break down collagen. So it slows that process down when you've got exposed dentine. It slows down those collagen fibrils being degraded and broken away. And finally, of course, it can interact with calcium and it can give us calcium fluoride and the silver precipitates can go into the dentinal tubules and block them. So you've got I don't think the, the actual detail of it's so important is remembering that there's actually a number of different mechanisms that uh, it works on. The other thing to say is that these things all take place in a very, very short space of time. So the chemists that I've spoken to about SDF, um, and I've actually spoken to one of the chemists who was involved in developing it and looked at the time frames that these all happen within. They all say that it works in just a matter of a few seconds, probably even less than that. That us leaving it on the tooth for a minute and moving it about and fiddling about with it probably isn't too important from a chemist's point of view. But I think as a clinician, you know, when you've got a lesion and you've got a micro brush and you've got a child wiggling about and you're trying to keep saliva, it's good to try and agitate it to allow it to get access to all the different parts of the cavity but you could always keep in the back of your mind that if you haven't managed to keep it there for a full minute, you've probably done as much as you needed to in a shorter space of time. OK, so let's talk a little bit about the off-label use. This is detailed in uh, the British Dental Journal paper that we published at the beginning of the, um, towards the end of last year, I think it was, where we talked 
a lot about how to use it, but also about how to get around the off-label use. So the slides that I'm going to show you today have been um, really adapted from that paper and have got the information in it. So off-label medicine means using it outside the terms of the licence for which it's been applied for in that country. We want to use SDF as a karyostatic agent. Um, however, it's licensed for tooth sensitivity and something called cavity cleansing. There um, are moves in the US to get it licensed and it's been, it's going through the process for that, being licensed for caries, and that's likely to happen uh, soon. So there's no liability related to its use in uh, the US when it's used as a karyostatic agent. So what do we have to do in the UK to use something off-label? Well, the first thing to remember is that many, many of the medicines that medics provide day in and day out are used off-label. They commonly do it. They're very comfortable and familiar with it. I think it's just something that we're not very comfortable or familiar with in dentistry because we don't come across it so much. There are very clear guidelines on when you can and can't use something off-label and what you have to do as a clinician to satisfy yourself that it's a good thing, it's the appropriate thing to use it off-label. So I've gone through them here and I've gone through the justifications. So the quotes on the left hand side are the ones from uh, that are, are on the licensing agency and tell us when we can and can't use something off-label. So we can't use it uh, we can use it if we're satisfied that an alternative licensed medicine wouldn't meet our, patient, meet our patient's needs. Now, the justification there is that SDF, although it's licensed as desensitising to cleanser, there's no alternative licensed medicine for karyostatic, uh, with a karyostatic mechanism the same as it has. So we can use it in that under those conditions. We can argue that quite clearly. The SDF is the only one that does what it does. And that's going back to that slide with the picture of the bacteria and the collagen and the remineralizing and blocking the tubules. Fluoride varnish doesn't do all of that. It does some of it, but not all of it. And we certainly know from the research papers that it's not as effective as silver dianine fluoride. So we can argue for use of silver dianine fluoride over fluoride varnish uh, in cases where there are active lesions. The second point is that such use would better serve the patient's needs than an appropriately licensed alternative. Well, that's the same thing, really. So we can justify using it because we don't have an alternative again. OK, and before using the medicine off label, we need to be satisfied that there's sufficient evidence and or experience of using the medicine. So um, I've written here that there are 30 randomised control trials, 11 systematic reviews, in fact, many more now that have been summarised in the recent umbrella review that we uh, published. I haven't gone into all the detail for the evidence because it's it's there and it's going to be really boring if I just go through one study after another. But it is worth saying that it worked much more consistently in terms of arresting dental caries than fluoride varnish, but it didn't work as well in preventing dental caries. I'm talking about primary teeth here. So I think we can make those justifications, as I said, for, for arresting caries, but I don't think it's there's sufficient evidence to use it as a preventive measure. And to be honest, I'm not sure why we ever would want to because of the discoloration anyway. It does have very specific indications. But I do believe there's sufficient evidence out there. It's not something that we're picking off to use randomly with just on a whim because we suddenly felt like it, it would be a good thing to do. OK, we've also got to take responsibility for prescribing the medicine and overseeing the patient's care. Well, that's what we do um, anyway. And we should record the medicine prescribed as well. So we'd have to record it in the patient's notes that we've used it. And we've used it off label. So those things I don't think are really big barriers uh, to us as clinicians. It's all about communication. It's all about understanding and it's about really speaking with our colleagues and all being on the same page with what we're doing when we decide to do it, what the indications and contraindications are and sticking to it. So within our department in Dundee, we did a, a little bit of training with people in the department. Um, 
got a few people together, did the training that way, but kind of disseminated it, watched each other, came up with the patient information leaflet as a group and came up with the uh, consent form that we use in the wording. Dr Blaine and I worked on that and uh, agreed on it and we stuck, everybody stuck to the same wording on the consent form. So we believe that we have the evidence, we have the justification, it's the only thing that we can use for this purpose. Uh, the evidence shows it works and we do give patients sufficient information. So you can see there that uh, giving patients and those authorising treatment on their behalf sufficient information about it is one of the key points as best practice for communication. This leaflet is available on the BSPD website. I'm sure it's not the best leaflet in the world. It's pretty good, it's got everything on it. Um, Nassar managed to get it all on one sheet of A4. We've tried to write it in simple language, but I have to confess it hasn't been run through a patient panel to check it uh, yet. So it's there if anybody wants to use it, but you may be able to come up with a better one. So the best practice for communication, again, um, is around using the information as parents, giving it to parents as you see relevant. So as you know, some parents carers want to know a lot of information about you, what you're doing. Um, some parents carers don't, and we've certainly come across in the department instances where parents want to know exactly all about SDF, what it is, what it does, how it works, who else uses it. Okay, so you're using it off label, what does that mean? What does that mean for my child? How safe is it? And we give them all the information. And then you've got these other patients who you explain it all to them and they just say, oh, whatever you think is best, if that's the best thing to do. But just giving all that information, at least as you know, gives a chance to have that conversation about whether it's the right thing for that child at that time. So again, just explaining to the parent carers the reasons for prescribing the medicine of label, where there's little evidence to support its use or where it's um, the use of the medicine is innovative. I don't think it's either of those things that we need to worry about. So there's lots of evidence to support its use. The Cochrane Review, I haven't mentioned before because it's not complete, but the Cochrane Review of SDF is underway and is nearly finished. We've been looking at all the evidence and um, May Wong in Hong Kong is actually putting together the data analysis just now. The complication from the Cochrane Review and putting that evidence in that format is that uh, those studies have been done in so many different ways, it's going to be difficult to combine them. But what we're finding is just the same as the Umbrella Review, which is just a systematic review done in a different way. But what we're finding is that the evidence still all points in the same direction. So I think no matter what kind of evidence we look at, whether it's primary studies, systematic reviews, um, umbrella reviews, or even what we consider the ultimate evidence, the Cochrane review, it's all showing us the same thing. So we can be confident in the evidence. Where, where the medicine's being used in an innovative way? Well, I think given the number of countries that it's being used in, I don't think we can really argue that it's innovative anymore and the amount of time since 1969 in Japan is hardly new. So I think we've got some reassurance from that point of view. The other best practice for communication point is around healthcare professionals um, being responsible to report adverse drug reactions. So we would just follow it as we do for any other um, adverse drug reaction that we come across. As part of the umbrella review and as of the Cochrane review, we've looked at the adverse events that have been reported wherever we can find them. And there were very, very few. They mainly related to staining, which I'm going to talk about in a little while and um, the taste and a few people felt that it had burned uh, the mucosa in the mouth with the, the feeling that they had on it. But that they were one case out of huge numbers of treatments in cohorts of children in schools. So the adverse event rate seems to be very low. We certainly we haven't come across any. Apart from the big one, which um, I don't think is an adverse event. It's a disadvantage because it's not something unexpected that happens. It's expected. So the darkening of lesions can obviously be a problem. Uh, you can see this picture here that we've put in. Curtisail, I think it's um, Travis in the US, Dr Travis, who's a colleague of mine over there, gave us this, which I think is a very nice picture that shows really 
what we started with that could have been repairable with a restoration probably fairly straightforwardly. Someone's used SDF on, he's used SDF for whatever reason, but it really doesn't look terribly great. So that is a disadvantage, there's no doubt from everybody's point of view. Oh. So we ha we're going to go through in a minute the steps for how to use SDF and we'll talk about before it's use and the clinical application of it. I'm not going to talk very much about following it up because you're all extremely experienced clinicians, but just I, I put this slide up that we use as our guide and again it's published in that British Dental Journal volume that you can see at the top of the screen. The follow-up that we tend to use, I follow my patients up about two to four weeks usually because they've got other treatment that needs done as well, but I also reapply it at that point. It's not been done in all of the studies, but the main reason I think it hasn't been reapplied in most of the studies is because most of them have been around patients, uh, children in school groups who've only had a single application twice a year. I think when I'm seeing my patients and I'm seeing them repeatedly, I've noticed that that second application does make a difference, it does seem to make it even harder uh, when they come back. But if you didn't feel it was needed, it's in no way mandatory as part of the, the treatment at all. And we apply it biannually in our department as well. So we'll talk about a little bit about before use and what happens and the clinical application of it. So we're on bullet point for how to use it. We're getting there. Before use, always handle it with care, wear gloves and make sure that you're avoiding its contact with anything, avoid that accidental staining. Bearing in mind, as I said, that it is clear liquid and it's just like water, it just flows like water if it spills. The capsules, the Nevastar capsules are incredibly wasteful of plastic, I have to say, um, they're single use, which is of course good. But the big advantage of them is that they tend not to fall over and when they do, the um, product doesn't fall out of it. So they're pretty good from that perspective. It doesn't have a big spillage when they drop over. Ensure everybody's got the PPE and I, I hesitated about putting that in because of course we've all got PPE now to the gunnels, but anyway, it's there. Obtain informed consent from the patient and of course the parent carer because of we dealing with children. I've added the last one in about taking photos at baseline. I know many people won't be able to do that and it's not essential, but it's very useful if you've got a child that you would prefer to do a different treatment on, you prefer some active treatment or you're unable to do it and you want to really be monitoring what's going on. I'm not sure that at the moment this is really high on our priority lists, but you might find that there's a case that you really do want to keep an eye on the progression of lesions and you have the ability to take photos. I think it's honestly the best way of monitoring a, a lesion and whether it's progressing or not. You can write ICDAS scores in till you're blue in the face or any other one, but they still, when it comes back and it's just got a little change, you can't see which direction it's going in. Whereas with a photograph, you can see very clearly when something's getting bigger or deeper or hasn't changed colour the way you want it to. While we're talking about progression, I think it's important to really point out that the main indicator for progression or lack of progression of a lesion for the lesion arresting isn't necessarily the colour change. The colour change is actually neither here nor there. It's helpful, but it's neither here nor there. The big indicator, as um, well, all of us know, I'm quite sure, is the hardness of the lesion. So when we carry out those stepwise caries excavation or selective caries removal and end up going back into a lesion, you know that when you go back into that lesion, it's rock hard. And that's what happens with SDF. It gets absolutely solid when it's covered in it. It's almost like it's been, to me, it looks like it's been, or it feels like it's been sealed uh, with a whole crown or with, with a restoration for a long, long period of time. It's very, very hard. It feels almost like stone. And that's the biggest indicator that the lesion isn't progressing. If the lesion is progressing, you either need to apply again, or more often, or you need to reconsider the treatment plan. Okay, so that's our leaflet. I was just put it in there to remember that we do that at the beginning. And these are our steps that we go through. So 
this is all stuff that you do without even thinking about it. We agree the treatment plan, we make sure everybody knows what's going to happen, we make sure everybody's safe. And uh, whenever I'm using it, I always rewarn my nurse that it'll stay in touch, unless it's my regular nurse who I know um, will actually say it for me. No. This is a, a picture of a lab coat immediately after a spillage of some Revastar onto a purposeful one, I would add. And this is an hour later. So you can see that sometimes you can't see where the lesion uh, or where the SDF has stained something immediately, but you'll see it later. Now that's of relevance to us if we think about the oral mucosa, because if you accidentally dab it on a child's lip or it flows onto their gingiva, it won't necessarily stain immediately, but it might later, and that could panic a, pa a parent if they see it, especially if it ends up being, I guess, on the outside of the lip. So we take precautions for that and try and avoid it, and we also warn parents that if it happens, it may look like a dark stain. But the good thing is that even if it does happen, if it's on skin or mucosa, is that the turnover, the natural turnover of the cells, epidermis cells, means that it disappears. So this is Nassar's hand immediately after he put some SDF on it. I don't know if you can see the picture that was painted on his hand there at the moment, but if I show you after an hour, PhD students obviously have too much time on their hands, I have to say, but there you are. That disappeared within a few days because the skin, the natural turnover of the cells on the skin meant that it was gone. So you can reassure patients that if that happens, that's what they'll see. But obviously, we want to avoid it. So clinical application. You don't have to remove caries at all. And the evidence certainly shows that there's no need. It doesn't make any difference to the arrest rates on a population basis. But I think it makes sense to remove anything that's blocking the cavity, blocking the cavity, whether it's a, a bit of, I don't know, ricicle or something that's in there, like frostings or whatever it is now, um, that somebody's had for their breakfast, that just prevents you getting access. Because if you think back to how SDF works, it works when it actually touches the lesion almost immediately. So you want to get it to a point of contact where you want it to work as soon as possible. So removing gross debris, giving it a wipe out with a wet cotton roll uh, or cotton pledge is probably a good idea just to make sure you can get the SDF to where you want. But don't worry about trying to remove any caves at all. There is no need. You want to try and work on what's there to arrest it. We apply petroleum jelly to the lips to try and remove uh, this chance of temporary staining. And we sometimes put a gingival barrier on the lesion. There's actually a gingival barrier in the Riva Star kit, but um, I tend to stick just, I know that some of my colleagues in the department use the gingival barrier a lot, but I tend to just stick to using cotton wool rolls to isolate and just the petroleum jelly. So clean, dry the caries lesion uh, or tooth tissue, whatever's there with the cotton wool rolls. Pierce the foil and the capsule. I don't know why I'm telling you, so I'm quite sure you can work this out for yourself. Apply the SDF, apply the micro brush to the SDF directly uh, and exactly where you want it to work. So. Remember, I said that it works within a few seconds again. So just get it straight on there and then roll it round. You don't need to agitate it. You don't need to do an awful lot of moving it about really vigorously or anything. It just needs to flow into the lesion. And I usually put it back into the capsule and then reapply it again. The evidence, and we cover it in the umbrella review, the evidence for toxicity is that there is very, very little chance of you ever causing any damage unless somebody was to drink several of these silver um, capsules and they were a tiny child. Applying it to the lesion is much, it's orders of magnitude less than we use with fluoride varnish, the amount of fluoride that's in here. And the same with the silver, it doesn't reach toxic values with, even if you were to apply it to all the teeth, using up every bit that's in the, the silver capsule you wouldn't come anywhere near the amount required to cause toxicity. So feel free to apply it, put the brush back into the capsule, put it back onto the lesion. Um, here again, I've put the asterisk and I've put the potassium iodide indications. You would stop using your, so your SDF, your silver capsule, gently dry the lesion a little bit with a cotton pledge it, and then pierce the foil in the green capsule with a clean micro brush and apply it again. 
you don't need to dry it. And um, the instructions from UCSF, University College Cal in San Francisco, don't dry it. They just put it straight on the top. When you put it straight on the top of silver dining fluoride liquid, you do get a lot of white precipitate because it's reacting, the, the potassium iodide reacting with the silver dining fluoride. That's the whole point of it. Or I, used to, I used to think the whole point of it was to remove what was left. But it seems that it does something more than that chemically and does assist the arresting. So I suggest that we consider using the potassium iodide from now on. So just some clinical pictures to brighten up because we're all clinicians and probably even after a busy day, you're keen to see more decayed teeth. These cavities, I would say, were pretty good and accessible to be used. But to use SDF, so isolation with cotton wool or gauze, whatever you're happy using. I've put in the AGP thing down here, so don't use your 3 one there's no need. Um, we've carried out a big systematic review of AGPs, which is just sitting at the, the GDR at the moment. Uh, but I don't mind telling you, one of the findings we had from that systematic review was that the 3 and one has very different levels of aerosol generated when it's used simply as water, which is its lowest aerosol generating um, uh, amount, to when it's used with just air. So it's got a moderate amount of aerosol generated when you just use air. But when you use air and water together, there is a massive increase in the amount of aerosol that you generate. So I know we're not using it at all. I think possibly in the future we might be okay using it with just water to wash if we need it to. But for the moment, we're not using it at all. And there's good reasons for that. So stick with just using your water on a pledge at the moment. So allow the SDF, as I've said, into, in there for a minute. Try to keep the tooth isolated for up to three minutes. That's just in the indication, but chemi chemically I'm not sure how important that is. Blot the excess and then you can always apply some sodium fluoride varnish if you want, just to enhance it. There's not really any evidence that says that applying uh, sodium fluoride varnish after SDF makes a big difference. There's a small amount of weak evidence that it might improve remineralization, so you can do it. The thing it does help with is probably the taste. So you, if you want to get rid of the metallic taste, which children can find very off-putting, you could use a little bit of sodium fluoride varnish on it and then the more likely to have that taste. I'm going to talk in a little minute about uh, silver modified ERT restoration. And we'll talk about that just in a moment. The other thing we do uh, sometimes just to get rid of that taste is to put a tiny little dab of toothpaste on the child's tongue just to, again, counteract that awful taste of metal. And just a picture of a micro brush in a cavity, in case you didn't know what that looks like, which we all do. We've said for about a minute. Um, here's a case that Clem Seabalik, uh, one of my colleagues in the department, took pictures of, which is SDF. So you can see the difference in the lesions. Uh, that's at the same appointment, uh, probably when the child comes back, you'll see it's actually even got a little bit darker, but you can see here. And I think what we're looking at here is this picture on the top has got the lesion with the cavitations. The SDF's being applied in the second picture. On the lower one, you can see the potassium iodide and the white precipitate that forms when it's used. And then you can see the lesions afterwards. So they'll probably even go a little bit darker than that when the child comes back. So the take homes, I put down some very pithy ones just after all of that. Dry it before use, use it twice a year. Um, you can't, I didn't put in consider using it again, repeating it, but you can. It stains everything it touches. I've said use 13% because there are different um, concentrations available in other countries. But the one that we have in the UK, the Reva Star, is the, the 38% one. And it, it's, it can be effective at arresting carious lesions. Where it's less effective is in back teeth compared to front teeth. And that's probably to do with the accessibility and the cleansability of the lesions rather than anything peculiar about the lesion activity. It's again thinking about back to that idea of the biofilm, the organisation, the city. The more disruption you can do, the better get it to arrest and obviously with those lesions on anterior teeth it's easier to disrupt them and the biofilm in there than it is on something like the upper 
first spring remola that we saw with the cavity that's a lot smaller and more sheltered, where the biofilm can reform very quickly and easily and grow. So non-AGP use, I've just popped that in there, but we've talked about it already to minimise things we use, cotton instead of compressed air. Okay, so I've got a couple of more slides uh, where I've talked a little bit about combining the use of SDF with other restorations. And one of the uh, things that's been done in the US quite a lot is a thing called SMART. Uh, they tend to use the silver daming fluoride and then use an ART restoration over the top. Uh, the SDF can obviously provide this nice solid foundation for your restoration. Uh, and they also use it with the whole technical short picture in a minute as well. Does it work? There's no clinical trials on it. There's some case reports and I've put the, the references for them there in case anybody wanted to look. But it's possibly a belt and braces approach that synergizes the benefits of both treatments. The disadvantage of putting a restoration over the top is that the lesion is no longer accessible to either your SDF or the tooth brushing that the, hopefully you've managed to change a child's behavior, parent's behaviour to undertake. So it does leave you um, being, you have to be absolutely confident that it's a solid restoration and it's not going to either come loose or have any edges on it or ledges or things that will attract plaque and again make that favourable um, environment for the plaque biofilm. These are some pictures of um, ART instruments. I actually had these posted over from Brazil because I couldn't get into the department to get some of the ones we had and we don't actually have a full set in our department at the moment. Um, we need if we're going to be serious about using SDF, uh, using ART as clinicians to have the right instruments. And up until now, I think we've really made do with what we've had, which are basically spoon excavators to get access. But this instrument that you can see that looks like a pyramid is used, it's called an opener. It's used to open the cavity. And I was keen that we that I had a look at it and we had a, a go with it to see how it works. I've had a colleague of mine, the Boulangerie, from Belgium send me some pictures of some cases and I'll show you them in a moment where he uses the correct ART instruments and he says they make a huge difference for access and clearing away unsupported enamel. So these aren't, although they're called excavators, they aren't used to excavate caves, they're simply used to um, get rid of unsupported enamel and make the lesion accessible. So this is uh, Thierry, some of his pictures, it's a carious first permanent molar he's used an opener to open it up. You can see it's partially erupted but already carious. He's then removed the peripheral soft carious tissue with the excavator, obviously not from the cavity floor because we don't need to. We know that sealing it in will arrest it anyway. Lesion looks like this when it's finished uh, clearing around the edge and he's then used Equia 40 using a press finger approach to restore that. Now, this was done under COVID times and as a non-AGP procedure that he's been undertaking for children in his care and his practice in Belgium. So you can see the resulting restoration there. It's certainly from a cariogenic bacteria, biofilm, city point of view. The restoration is much preferable to us to stop it progressing, whereas the picture that you saw at the beginning back here, this lesion in that first picture, tiny little opening, massive carious lesion underneath compared to the opening size, that white balloon that you can see round about is all carious. That is a holiday home city for bacteria, uh, whereas we've made it unfavourable in this one. There's no way it can get in. So it's maybe not everybody's perfect restoration, but it's certainly from a non-AGP point of view preferable. This is a silver modified ART restoration that he sent me a picture of as well from his practice that, uh, where he's used SDF and then later time restored the lesion with GI because he felt it made it favourable to cleansing. Here was with the open lesion he still felt the parents weren't managing to get in to brush it. So uh, that's what a smart restoration will look, back, look like. It's not a zirconia crown. It doesn't look like something we might be incredibly proud of, but actually from a caries management point of view, it's first class. 
it's doing exactly what we want it to do. It's arrested, it's stained, it's hard, it's cleansable. It needs monitored, but there is, it's better than what was there before, and it's certainly going to slow down progression of that lesion. Um, I've put in a reference to a systematic review that talks about adhesives following SDF treatment to glass ionomer cement. And basically what it shows is that there's not a massive amount of evidence in there. There's some evidence, but it doesn't become massively conclusive. It's slightly conflicting. But as I said to you, there aren't any clinical trials. If you wanted to do it, it would be on a basis of uh, first principles and cardiology. It looks like it's doing a better job than what was there before, and it would need monitored. Uh, sorry, there's not a picture of a crown, but you could also apply SDF before you put on a whole technique crown to, again, try and speed up that erase process and make sure that happens. Now, I've said, use SDF, you've got a full history. If the tooth is asymptomatic, obviously, if there's any kind of pulpitis there, we shouldn't be using it. And um, we want to try and use, a use it on a lesion that's accessible to the microbrush and preferably, spelled wrongly, accessible to a toothbrush to maintain cleaning of the lesion and try and continue that arrest process. So just to finish up, I thought I've got the advantages and disadvantages and things listed, but they're all very straightforward. I thought before I went through them and the indications and contraindications, I would ask you to have a think based on your own experience, the children that you see, the caries that you see and your understanding of the biofilm whether you thought the SDF was indicated in these cases. Um, these are ones that we could always have a, a little bit of a discussion on when we finish in a few minutes, if you wished, because uh, there's no hard and fast rules, I think, at the moment. So the first lesion, if I just take this back, that I'd want you to think about would be this one, this big lesion here on this tooth. And it's just think yourself whether you would use SDF in that case if you had a radiograph showing that. And I know, of course, you would always have a radiograph and a clinical picture together. I haven't gone to the, the extent of giving you treatment planning cases to do because I just thought it was a little bit insulting. Um, and there's this lesion here as well. And I think it's worth pointing out that these are different, very different, even radiographically, if we couldn't see them. This is probably accessible, which is a good thing, but it's also through to the pulp, isn't it? So um, I think we'd be looking for a different solution to that, even though we can't see a periodicular problem, obvious one at the moment. This lesion's got different issues. It's not accessible at the moment to the SDF and it's very close to the pulp as well. So we would be looking in a non-AGP with not very many other options and we wanted to do something with that, but for some reason it couldn't be a hall crown, which is obviously the ideal treatment for it. If you wanted to use SDF, we would have to open that up and it would be whether you could use that um, pyramid-shaped opener to get in there or not. And both of these as well, problematic for getting access to. This one probably less so, but again it would depend what it looked like clinically. And I've put some clinical pictures in as well, so if we just, oh, just put them up. No, I'm putting the fourth one. These I think are the ones that people are tempted to use SDF on, but I think it's worth considering whether these are actually it's possible to do anything. And I know if we're trying to avoid an extraction, it's very, very tempting to try absolutely anything. Certainly the first one here, I would say that is dental pulp you can see shining through. So SDF isn't going to do anything for that at all, that poor soul. Um, the middle one, we've got a residual glass ionum in here doing nothing. But the rest of it, I think, is so cavitated and down with the pulp. Again, it's probably beyond healing. Um, and um, SDF, as always, save the whole technique as well, isn't a Lazarus restoration. This last one, I think if you were forced here, you could argue that there's possibly a good amount of dentine over the pulp. I would want to know what the radiograph looks like, but you may, if you can't see the pulp through that one, consider trying it. But again, I think it's so far gone that you know, we're not using this as a last resort. You can see the kind of lesions that I'm thinking it's indicated for in the last slides, whereas this one might be a possibility. OK, advantages, indications and contraindications. These are all listed out in the British Dental Journal article, and you can go back through these slides and have a look at them certainly at a later time. But they're all really things that you're very, very familiar with. 
The indications are asymptomatic, cavitated, dentine lesions, not these massive, deep things that are through to the pulp. It's got to be something that can be cleansed, is cleansable, but can be arrested, um, keeping the dentine over the dental pulp, trying to get that solid base again, protecting the pulp, keeping it safe. I think another indication is that it's non-restorable in the past. Now, does it have to be non-restorable for us to resort to SDF? I'm not sure. I think we've got other indications now in terms of COVID. Um, several caries lesions can be treated at once, which is great. Root surface lesions can be uh, treated. We don't tend to have many of them in permanent teeth in children, of course. Non-caries cervical lesions that give sensitivity can be useful for. And actually, we've had some some um, positive results with MIH teeth, where we've got these incredibly sensitive ones. The thing I would say is when you use it on MIH teeth and there is no clinical trial and there's no studies that I've been able to find at all, but if you did, then you would find that there was uh, a little bit of a nippiness from the child. So, from the person point of view, it's really anything being considering being able to manage the child's behaviour and keeping them in mind that you need them to have a high standard of brushing. Contraindications are just exactly the opposite. So clinical signs and symptoms of irreversible pulpitis, dental abscess, radiographs, infection, radiographs showing pulp involvement, signs of infection and ongoing active lesions, you need to change your treatment plan. From a patient point of view, you've got to have cooperation. I said that um, potassium iodide is contraindicated in pregnant or breastfeeding women. I've just put it in there because it is one of the things that's listed. And ulceration, mucositis and stomatitis, we wouldn't use it at all. And obviously an allergy to any of the components. So the indications are, are here. Really, it fits in with the lesions and behaviour, and I wouldn't even begin to try and tell you how to gauge those behaviours and things, but I've put them in for completion. And the advantages and disadvantages are all those that we've covered. Um, and at the child level as well. They don't like the taste and it discolours, but the advantages we know about. The final slide that I've got here is just about us as clinicians. So it requires very little technical skill to do and it's quick and cheap and it works, but it does require strong diagnostic skills. It requires an understanding of the caries lesion and you need to have good people management skills. I think if we're thinking of using SDF, we have to be prepared to think about it in uh, alignment with behaviour management and, or, sorry, behaviour change and trying to get brushing going and that monitoring. Oh, the final one I put up there, the point about it being satisfying is really that it isn't very satisfying to do SDF because when you see it back, it doesn't look nearly as pretty as some of the other things we do. But that's a, a thing that we have to take with us. Uh, just thank you to these people who were all involved in the research and the gathering of the information, the slides, putting them together uh, along with me and the long journey that we're having with SDF. So just thanks to them. And thank you for your great patience. I hope I've managed to cover everything, but I'm sure we'll find out uh, in the slides. I can't seem to find my mouse to stop presenting. There we are. So yeah, we'll find out in the questions what we need to, if anything, still discuss. Okay, thank you. That took a lot longer than it did when I tried to out, so my apologies. Could be a slow start. Absolutely no apologies needed at all, Nicola. That was amazing. Thank you so much. A, for doing this in the evening, B, your own time. And can I totally reassure you that you are never insulting ever and that the specialists could of, uh, often, um, we, we are such thick skinned, we can take anything, but you are personally never insulting. And as always, you've covered the subject in such great depth. I've been looking through some of the questions on um, that have come through. Uh, David, I'm sure, has done a more thorough job. I, I was so enthralled with you. Um, 
So there was a question on allergies um, or the use with thyroxine. You've covered that. Um, obviously, we have a, um, a question or a few questions raised about the licensing, but I think you've covered that in um, as full as anybody could uh, cover that and um, given us all the information with regards to the leaflets and consent diagnosis, as well as I think we've covered history, microbiology, chemistry, spelling, law, photography, tattooing and mechanics in, in such a, a thorough, thorough, thorough discussion of the subject. Um, so thank you, really thank you. Um, David, has any, um, can you come in with any other questions? I'm just reading a few yeah. brilliant Thanks, Nicola. I think you must have uh, preempted everything there. Um, I haven't had anything else um, so far. Um, but if it, I think Mary Skeen raised her hand a moment or two ago. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to raise their hand or um, or, or, or um, stick a question in for the chat function. If if they have any other questions, please. I I think. I can't see everybody's hands. David has they're that, but they're um, all, they're all <laughs> no, they're all singing your praises. Superb, brilliant. Can't thank you enough. Time much appreciated. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. And that is what is coming through as as you are. Could, could I just you, you did cover the. Um, sensitivity um brilliantly and um, i just um lost the sound a little bit when we were talking about mih and what um what um symptoms the patient can sometimes feel or was it a scott was it something scottish that i didn't catch possibly it's okay it'll be welsh next week <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we've, I've only used it on three patients who have had MIH and it was, they were all quite severely MIH and they were partially erupted and we couldn't do anything else really and we tried sticking on things and, and whatnot. It was really, um, I'd used it as a last resort. The thing that I, I noticed because the three children that we tried it on were all experiencing extreme sensitivity from the teeth. And we tried fluoride, we'd had the toothbrushing, uh, the toothpaste being wiped on, we'd used all sorts of different things. They did notice when I put the SDF on their tooth uh, that it became quite sensitive and it was almost, they described it as a tingling. One child actually said he felt like it was, it was a quick flash on his tooth, you know, like a burn, a little burning feeling. He didn't describe it as burning, but that's my interpretation of what he was saying. And yeah, it was more about tingling and they definitely noticed it. And that was all three of them. I think all three of them. Certainly it stands out in my mind. There's one little boy who's lovely. But uh, they all also noticed an improvement as well. But I did have to repeat it. Certainly in the boy was the most severe one. We repeated it a few times and it was almost like it, the benefits wore off. And he, he didn't look forward to feeling the tingling again. So it's obviously a little bit uncomfortable to some extent. Nippy. Yeah, Alison. <laughs> Nippy. That's probably what I said. <laughs> Nippy, not English. Nippy, yeah. Oh, actually, no. I, I did get it. It, it was my ears, not, not Scottish nippy. My <laughs> patients never get it, Alison. They never understand it. <laughs> um, we had so, a couple more questions. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Jane. Oh, we had a couple sorry, more yeah. questions. Um, one was how um, could we possibly resolve the licensing situation. Um, and the second one was, um, is this something we could train dental nurses to do? Um, the licensing situation, I think, in all honesty, I was just about to bluff that one. I don't know the answer to it. I can tell you what I think, but I, can, I don't know the answer. What I think is that it probably needs to be done through the company and what I also think is that it's highly unlikely they're going to do that because to get it licensed again, they would have to pay a massive amount of money and it wouldn't even be, I don't think, through the EU systems, which is where it was originally put through. So there would be no doubt post-Brexit, uh, 
I was going to say post-COVID there, we're all wishing for that. Post-Brexit, it will be a different process and it, they might need to start the whole thing again. Um, the other, the issue I think around licensing is that I don't think we need to worry too much about it. I think we do need to be prepared to accept that it's being used off license. I think if another company comes to the UK and they want to try and use it or market it, they'll probably try for key issues because we can persuade them. And I've spoken to a few companies who were thinking about it. We can persuade them that they're more likely to have uptake from clinicians if it doesn't need to be used off label. So, yeah, I think we almost need agreement that this is what we're going to use as a specialty. This is why we're going to use it. These are the advantages and disadvantages of it. And this is why we think it's the only thing we can use. But I don't think you can go, and I, as again, I'm saying I don't know the answer, but I don't think you can get it licensed from a different route. I think it has to come through the company when they apply for the license for that particular medication. I don't know why I'm still talking because I really, I don't know the answer. I, I'll try and find it out actually. Thanks very so much, Question. Yeah, I don't see why they can't use it any differently. I suppose if you wanted to be sure you could, to be sure you could, have it prescribed by um, a dentist, but I don't see, and you know, if you've got the same information, the same evidence, and it's being used in your area, uh, why you wouldn't, but again, you might want to be safe just given the licensing arrangements. So then we've got an easy question. I don't think we've had any others. It, the, the only other one was was um, was it was about uh, whether we could train dental nurses to perform the procedure. I guess that would follow the fluoride varnish kind of route, but yeah, there's slightly more care needed. It's slightly different issues, but there's no reason why we couldn't train if we got, went through the same route to get permissions and get it all sorted out. Yeah. Great, thanks very much. Oh, oh uh, NASA is just asking, asking there, can you jump in? Oh. I believe if the dental nurse had undertaken the child smell training course, they can apply silver diamine fluoride. Um, oh. I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. We can check that out with child smell, but that's, thanks Nassar. I hope I did justice to your work. <laughs> okay, dokey. Right, I think that looks about all of them. Nicola, thank you so very, very much. I'll hand back Absolutely. over to you, Jean. <laughs> well, no, thank you to you both. Um, so um, can I just repeat that Nicola has very, very kindly um, donated uh, at her fee, um, not that she would accept one anyway, to the Vasculitis Scotland charity. And um, if anybody... Um, from the consultants group would like to donate a little bit. That would be fantastic from all around. Can I thank you so much again, Nicola, for your time and thank your family for allowing you such space. Um, and can I believe that you've given permission for this recording to be placed on the BSPD website for anybody who missed it? Obviously holiday time for most, but um, Thank you so much again, and uh, go and have a large glass of wine. <laughs> thank you. I don't deserve it. Okay, so um, thank you again. CPD certificates um, are actually on the um, or on the teams on the on the files, um, if an attached file onto the teams meeting. Uh, but if you are having difficulty um, accessing that, then please do contact me. Uh, d.ald uh, at nhs.net um, and yeah so the CPD for certificates will be there um, and I'll find a way of getting the um, getting this up on the uh, YouTube channel I'll leave with, with Claire or whoever um, otherwise we'll find another way of, of sending you a link around to, to everyone who's uh, who might be interested and hasn't been able to join tonight because we've had huge amounts of interest it's been fantastic so um, yeah, thank you so very, very much, Nicola. Thanks again. No, thank you for the invitation. It was an absolute pleasure. It was lovely. Thank you, everybody who's given up their evening to come and listen. I'm sure you could have watched it. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you, right. Nicola. Thank you. Great stuff. Bye. Thank you and good night. <laughs> good night. Good night.